You are listening to Inspire Change, a broadcast that strives to educate, motivate, and empower men to challenge traditions of masculinity. To guide us through the intricacies and intersections of emotions, relationships, and male identity is renowned psychologist, author, and speaker, Gunter Swoboda. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Inspire Change. Okay, so the last episode, I talked about uh, when love goes wrong, okay? So, because it does, and uh, as a psychologist and a therapist, I deal with the process of love going wrong and the outcomes of that virtually on a daily basis. At least probably a third of my clients uh, are, are somehow being affected by a relationship where you can literally talk about uh, the whole issue of love going wrong. This particular episode, I want to focus on when love really goes wrong and put it into the context of why it really goes wrong. So, you know, again, I've been focusing in the previous podcast about attachment, you know, about attachment disorders or attachment problems. So we talked about anxious, avoidant, disorganized uh, or fearful avoidant attachment issues and how they might manifest to some degree. I want to take it a little bit further because I think this is very, very relevant. There's been a number of um, sort of issues that have arisen in the last 35 to 40 years in terms of uh, understanding what's happening in terms of our mental health and, you know, psychological distress and disorders. So there's been certain conditions that have been focused on a lot. One of those is post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, childhood trauma, and essentially what we refer to as uh, personality disorders. And there are two in particular which uh, I've seen really very much at the core of when love goes really, really wrong. Um, and this is not about being judgmental. I want to put that out there straight away. This is about being able to, in myself, identify whether I have any of these characteristics or whether you are in a relationship with someone who may have. Now, it's not your role and it's not my role to diagnose that person, but it is part of suggesting to the person if there's any suspicion of that or taking myself off to, you know, my GP or my therapist and go, look, this I identify with some of these issues. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to sort of lay this out. And when I talk about personality disorders in particular, I'm going to be talking about the issue of narcissistic personality disorder and the other one, which is what's called the borderline personality disorder. And I want to go through that so that you've got a bit of an idea uh, as you're listening to this. Well, we're really talking about because um, there's an upside to this, un unlike with, say, um, bipolar one or um, schizophrenia, where uh, borderline and narcissistic and borderline personality disorders actually respond, can respond to good psychotherapy. And in times, also a combination of medication and psychotherapy. So there's a real, there, there is a light at the tunnel, and I don't want anybody to think that this is sort of, you know, if you've got this, it's terminal in some way. That's that's really not what this is about. But it's really important to understand what happens if I am a person who's got these characteristics in a relationship, and what that does to me and the other person in the relationship with me. Okay, because you know it's not a question now of loving. It's 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 really a question of how I can connect with the other person in a healthy way, as opposed to the way that I've been connecting, which is fundamentally unhealthy a lot of the time. And so, if I'm not well and my partner's not sure what's going on, the chances are they're going to respond in an unhealthy way. So, for example. <clears throat> 
in the area of drug and alcohol, uh, one of the things that happens frequently is in addictions, if I have a partner, my partner either is very clear about their boundaries and about what they expect in the relationship, and when I don't deliver that as the person with the addiction, they have every right to go, I need to leave. Because to stay and to constantly negotiate with the person about their their behaviour is fundamentally, most of the time, just enabling them because they're not experiencing any consequences that urge them to change because there's no, there's no negatives, there's no downside because, you know, one of the things that often happens in that context is that my partner will, you know, pick up the slack for me. They will do the things that I should be doing. They will cover up for me. And part of this pattern is also observable in a relationship where one person has uh, what we call a personality disorder. Okay, so it's very, very important to get that clear. Okay, so as I said, we're going to be talking about the narcissistic personality disorder and then we're going to be talking about uh, the borderline personality disorder. Now, that's possibly going to take two podcasts to do, okay? And I'm also, I also want to talk about what treatment in these areas really means. And one of the challenges is that a lot of couples where there is one person or even sometimes both people with a personality disorder uh, they go into couples counselling and then for one reason or another, and it's often a little bit complicated, the couples therapy goes nowhere. And so in my view, when I've detected or when I've identified that one person or both people may have an issue like that, I, I need to get the person with a personality disorder to seek treatment, individual treatment, so that it gives the potential for couples therapy a better um, foundation, a better platform to come from. Okay. So in recent times, uh, the, the catchphrase in social media and in the media in general and so on around, you know, um, couples and where love really goes wrong, is the issue of the narcissistic personality disorder. Now, most of the time people talk about so-and-so is a narcissist. Now, as a psychologist, you know, that, that requires a little bit of thinking because, for me, a narcissistic personality disorder is a diagnosable condition. Um, and usually it's, it's represented by a sort of inflated sense of their own importance with the a real need for uh, essentially excessive attention, admiration. Um, they have usually a history of troubled relationships. But one of the key markers is that they do not operate with the same sort of empathy that you, you or I as people without the personality disorder would have. Um, and generally speaking, underneath this, mask of bravado, you know, inflated self-confidence, um, the person actually has what we refer to as a narcissistic wound. In other words, they are generally highly, highly fragile and, and particularly affected by even just the slightest criticism. So, you know, it's not like they're bulletproof. In fact, the, the reality is that the person with these characteristics, with this disorder, are highly vulnerable. Um, the other part of it is that usually a person with a narcissistic personality disorder has a history of problems in life in general. I've already mentioned relationships, but it's also work, at school, financial affairs, um, and they they often are actually quite unhappy uh, and and feel that sense of not being recognised, not being given um, the accolades or admiration that they feel they deserve quite deeply. One of the comments often is that they will find their relationship 
with their partners deeply unfulfilling. Uh, and they'll observe that some people actually don't want to be around them at all. So, you know, the big question about this is, you know, how does this come into being? How does a person develop um, a narcissistic personality disorder? And this is a bit tricky because, to put it bluntly, we actually really are just at the beginning of understanding what happens. Now, one of the things that I talked about is that, you know, the person has an, a, a very fragile relationship with themselves. So the the question that comes up here is how did that develop? Now, there's been some suggestions. Um, the, the obvious one that always pops up is genetics, that it's inherited characteristics. People often talk about the neurobiology behind that. Now, in both areas, certainly with genetics, we don't necessarily have, you know, really solid evidence for that. Uh, in terms of neurobiology, that is that the connections between brain and behavior and thinking are different. Well, that might be true, but it doesn't tell us necessarily exactly why. So for me as a psychologist and someone who's particularly interested in the whole of impact of the system and the situation on the individual, uh, uh, a firm candidate for causality is the environment. And the one in particular is that there's a mismatch in, parent, in the parent-child relationship. So quite often what we find is that there's either excessive admiration for the child or excessive criticism. And the, the parent doesn't really quite tune into the kid very well. So there's, as we come back to the previous podcast, a an attachment mismatch or an attachment disorder. And so, so this is probably the most fruitful area to look at in many respects. Now, the interesting thing too is when we look at, well, what causes a, a, a narcissistic wound? It could be, you know, anything that the child can't accommodate in their mental sort of environment, you know, they can't make sense of things. So why am I being criticised or why do my parents think I'm the best thing since sliced bread? So there's a whole range of things. Now, part of this pattern is that, as I said, the person with narcissistic personality disorder tends to be prone to stress. They may not show it. They frequently have interpersonal relationship difficulties. They, interestingly enough, also will go through periods of anxiety and depression. Um, sometimes they might present with uh, impulse control issues, like taking high-risk things into account. So, you know, drug and alcohol misuse, um, the capacity to, um, you know, get get into sort of intense um, sports where there's a strong possibility that they'll get lots of social reward for, you know. So it's also about, you know, interestingly enough, trying to get some stimulation going uh, in themselves where they can uh, try to get in touch with a greater sense of self-worth or self-esteem. Why well, is a bit funny about that word self-esteem? What does that really, really mean? But we won't get into that right now. So some of the symptoms here are things like, you know, um, a sense of entitlement and, you know, requiring constant admiration. Um, you know, they expect to be recognised that it's superior without necessarily delivering the, the goods. Um, they might even exaggerate their achievements and their talents. Um, they spend a lot of time... Um, you know, being preoccupied with fantasies about success, power, brilliance, beauty, or interestingly enough, vicariously about having the per perfect mate. And this is where it often goes really wrong because if they find that their, their mate's not exactly perfect, it gets very, very rocky. Um, in, in social situations, one of the characteristics that 
can manifest is they very quickly monopolise conversations uh, and, and they'll belittle or be very critical of people who they don't see as an equal. Now, that's interesting because they don't see most people as equals anyway. In fact, they see most people as being somewhat inferior. Um, there's a tendency to expect uh, compliance with their expectations. So in a relationship, you can imagine what that, so how that unfolds. Um, they certainly don't see because they don't have any or they don't relate with a great deal of empathy, um, they don't recognise other people's needs and feelings. Um, and if they do, then it's all about them in the first place anyway. Um, now, you've got to remember that much of this is on a sort of scale going from the sort of almost benign to the extraordinarily intense, um, you know, and with all of this, too, comes the need to have things that um, tell the story of their superiority and success. And so things like, you know, the best of everything, you know, when people start talking about, oh, I, just, I just like the best of everything, my red flag starts going off because, you know, fundamentally in order to feel okay, in order to enjoy life, you don't necessarily need to have the best of everything anyway. Um, you can just make do. I mean, living in a hut, you know, would, if you're happy, right, would be sufficient. Except we come back to that principle. Internally, this person is not happy in themselves. They expect potentially other people to, you know, recognize their, you know, how good they are and reward them for it on a constant basis. The problem is it's never enough, it's a bottomless pit. It's like this bucket with a hole in it where you keep pouring water in it and the water just runs out and you've got to keep replenishing it. And we talk about, in that context, the narcissistic supply. So, you know, in a, in a relationship, eventually the partner of someone with a narcissistic personality disorder gets to the point where they just can't do it anymore. And so what are some of the consequences of this? Well, basically... Let me come back to the relationship. They're often impatient and they get angry very quickly when they don't receive that sort of special treatment, that sort of, you know, oh, you know, I love you because you're the best, blah, 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 okay? Um, they frequently, if they're stressed, can react with rage or contempt and will try to belittle the other person, all right, as a way of compensating for their own sense of fragility, um, so regulating emotions is a bit of a struggle, you know, for the person, especially, you know, as stress increases. Um, overall, there can be a cycle of moving through feelings of depression uh, and moodiness, um, especially if they're strongly confronted with the fact that they're really not perfect, Um and so this enhances then this underlying bubbling sense of vulnerability, insecurity, uh, but generally speaking, the person's not really in touch with that. So what happens when a person puts their hand up and goes, well, I think I, I, uh, I sort of relate to this reluctantly because a lot of people will try to avoid identifying with this and they'll often be very defensive about it and go, well, that's not me, that's just everybody else's perception and that doesn't count anyway. But on the plus side, if you do take ownership, because there's a difference between being mentally ill where you have a certain get-out-of-jail card in terms of your responsibility to a degree, not entirely. With this, this is a disorder, this is not an illness. Uh, so I, if I have or identify these characteristics, I have a responsibility to take ownership for that especially when I'm in a relationship with a partner and some children, to, to address this, to change it. As I said right at the outset, you know, the, the, the prognosis fundamentally, once you're in treatment and you pursue treatment and stay with it, can actually be really positive. You, you know, we can change. This is the whole point in many respects with my 
podcast is that even with something like that, we can change. But our first step is I need to own my part in the problem. And if that happens to be that I have this thing, this personality that is structured in such a way that is fundamentally a defense mechanism against the you know, perceived onslaught of the world, I need to let that go. I need to move into a space where I strip away my defenses, heal the wound, and then, in a way, learn how to behave differently. And it's possible. I do this a lot. There's another form of narcissism, which is called acquired narcissism, which is what, as men, we're often prone to, because it's a, it's still a patriarchal society, and you know we have some privileges, and with those privileges come some, you know, interesting adaptive or maladaptive behaviours. Okay, so I hope that's been useful. I want you to reflect on that. As I said, I'm not diagnosing anybody. I'm giving you some pointers about, you know, understanding oneself and others a little better. But you can't use it as a weapon, okay? That is completely out of bounds. So you can't throw this at your partner even when you think it is. You need to just have a discussion about it. In, this, in an open, non-blaming, non-judgmental way. Because, you know, if you have a broken arm and you don't know it's broken, but every time you try to use it, it hurts, um, having, you know, someone hit it and go, does that hurt, uh, is not a really useful thing or a caring thing or a loving thing to do. All right, that brings me to end, to the end of today's podcast. And until next time... And in the next podcast, we will talk about the borderline personality disorder in a very short hit, okay? I could do a whole lot more about it, but I just want to get that out there as a sort of hint at understanding what can go wrong when love really, truly goes wrong. Until next time, this is me signing off. Thank you for listening to Inspired Change, a broadcast that strives to educate and motivate and empower men to challenge traditions of masculinity. For more information on the Making Good Men Great movement, or for individual and group coaching sessions with Gunter, visit goodmengreat.com. For inquiries regarding broadcast topics or appearing on the show, email miranda at noartainment.com. That's miranda at n-o-i-r-t-a-i-n-m-e-n-t.com.